I, I, I sometimes think that I have a, a weird job because, you know, I worked in, in the trenches of a lot of stuff on the internet. I worked on, on deploying things directly for a long time. And now, you know, because I'm the CEO of the Internet Society, I, I'm not allowed to know anything in particular. Uh, I have to, I have all the staff and they all know particular things. And I'm really kind of uh, uh, out of touch with things that I was used to being a, a really, you know, hands-on expert about. And this sometimes frustrates me, but on other times it, uh, it gives me a, a, an opportunity to see uh, a, a picture of, uh, of an arc of the way that the internet is developing and so on. And Ethiopia is, is at this moment uh, such an exciting moment in its history where there is this enormous opportunity. So we just spoke a couple of times, uh, Mitruki mentioned it, and we just mentioned it as well, this idea of leapfrogging. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it is a, um, a, a real opportunity. When I was speaking earlier this morning, I was talking a little bit about how the history of the internet uh, developed, and I was trying to set the table for the way the rest of this meeting would go, that there were these two critical things that made the internet an important and valuable contributor to the way, to the way people could use it. And one of them was this, this feature of the network that it, it, it isn't that smart. The idea is the network stays out of the way, pieces out at the edge. Can, do, can, can be the intelligence in the system. And the reason for that is, was an insight that some people discovered uh, about how the, the, the most valuable applications work because the application is close to the person who's using it and so the application knows what is needed. And the second piece um, that uh, was a consequence of that really is that because the network doesn't have a lot, of, a lot of controls built into it, it means that you can do these innovations and new innovations can come along, new things can come along, and they can be picked up and you can just deploy them. And you don't have to worry about a long deployment cycle. So those are two critical pieces that I think ought to, ought to focus our minds on what, what is it that we need from the development of, of the network here in Ethiopia. And I think that part of the answer to that is, is another piece that came from that history. Uh, and that was the tendency of the internet to depend on voluntary collaboration using open standards. And the reason this was so important, the reason it was necessary is because if you have a number of different networks and they're supposed to collaborate with one another, there are really only two ways you can do that. One way is you can build an expensive and bureaucratic and extremely slow mechanism to introduce everybody to one another. And that is the traditional way that we used to build uh, different kinds of networks. Different kinds of networks were built using this, this mechanism that really depended on a lot of lawyers. But there's another way to do it. And it's the, the way the internet selected. And that is to set a bunch of rules, we call them protocols, you set those rules in advance. And if you follow the rules and I follow the rules, even if we don't know each other, our stuff will work together because we're following the same set of rules. And this means that you can develop new things very quickly. You can develop these things quickly and also you can develop these things in a way that allows them to evolve and change. So these features, the open network built of these kinds of protocols, the network that doesn't get in the way, that is neutral and allows innovation without the network being in control of it all, these are critical features for why the internet took off, why it seems to have supplanted all kinds of other network technologies. At the Internet Society, we like to call this the internet way of networking. It's a, it's a central piece of the kinds of things that we work on. We try to pay attention to those sorts of things and to influence them positively. But you might be asking yourself, why is this guy from Canada up there talking about all of this? We're here to talk about the internet in Ethiopia. 
And I want to try to convince you that this is a choice that Ethiopia gets to make right now. There are really a couple of models going on right now about network development. One is the internet way of networking that I just described. And then there are a bunch of alternative network development um, uh, approaches, but one in particular that a number of people are trying to, uh, trying to promote. Now they always call this an alternative internet, but I like to call it the pretender net because it doesn't really give you the advantages of the network of networks. It doesn't really give you the advantages of the internet way of networking. And I want to convince you that the internet way is a better way. Now, as I said earlier, it's an exciting time for the development of the internet in Ethiopia. Historically, Ethiopia had low internet penetration rates. But right now you're undertaking a number of uh, reforms to the telecommunications environment here. And those reforms, when they've been tried elsewhere, we just heard um, uh, about how they have been tried elsewhere, and they have resulted in a boom in, uh, in communication use. Think about going from a 16 kilobit line. Many of you are too young, I think, to know what a 16 kilobit line is. It's uh, so slow. Um, but uh, those of us who have been around for a number of years, we remember those terrible days, and we assure you that it's a bad idea. And so it's this enormous opportunity to build new infrastructure without having to go through all of that, all of that terror, without having to you know, build many, many layers of different NATs and all the rest of it in order to get around the limitations of IPv4. As Machuki was saying earlier, you can just deploy IPv6 from the get-go and deliver a network that is much better. You don't have to develop uh, workarounds for outdated systems that you have, like we have to do all of the time in Canada. But all of this is technical benefits. Technical benefits are not the real story here. Technical benefits would not be enough to make enough difference. The open network, the network of open protocols, the network that doesn't try to control what you can do, the network that permits innovation, those are all factors that are really important. They're influences in the way the internet developed but they're technical facts. That's what made it possible for the internet to grow. But what made the internet really grow? What made it take off? It was humans. Humans were the thing that made it really go. It was the desire of people to make their lives better, to work together to solve the problems that they had. And in that way, the internet is a profoundly human technology. This is a country with a young population, just looking around this room. It's nice to be in a country with a young population. I'm from North America, right? Everybody's getting old. Uh, you think you laugh, but it's true. Um, so what, what, what we see here is a population that you know, can work on these, uh, on these technologies and then enjoy the benefits of those local developments for many, many years. There's another advantage that Ethiopia has. You have a, a large population. It's a large population, it's pretty diverse, there are a lot of languages here. But the many languages are, have, this, have this nifty feature. They're, they're written, many of them are written in a, in a script that is not widely shared around the rest of the world. Uh, you know, they're, they're written in a local, writing system. Now, this makes a fantastic opportunity for develop of development of local technology. When you have a large population of speakers of a language who are mostly not found elsewhere, that population gets well served by local providers. The local providers have an incentive to work on those things, to develop um, uh, the systems. And what we'll see, I think, people developing uh, systems that deliver services to people in their local tongue and in their local script. At the same time, because the internet is a global resource, Ethiopians will get access to the global networks, to the global markets, to the global source of information. And so you get to build out your network according to the best current practices. You can use all the best techniques, the best things that everybody in the world knows how to do. Your population can grow and thrive. 
show everybody what a prosperous Ethiopia can be, but this is the promise that the internet offers if it is deployed wisely. Now, look, I'm the president and CEO of the Internet Society. My enthusiasm about the internet can get away from me. And we all know that the internet presents some challenges. Uh, I worked, back in the 1990s, I worked on some uh, internet access projects in Canada. Uh, and in those days, nobody ever asked whether this was such a good idea. We would just deploy it. The internet was all opportunity. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we learned that sometimes things go wrong. Now, again, this is a profoundly human technology, the internet. Like humans, it offers enormous good to the world. It can help information flow so that someone far from a market can know what the prices are or where demand is rising. It can bring education to remote places. Canada is a, is a very rural country. A lot of Canada is, is very far from the cities. Um, we're only 35 million people or so spread across this enormous land mass, and most of, the, most of the land mass is not heavily populated. And so small villages have used the internet in order to not send their kids to school thousands of kilometers away. Instead, they're using the internet to provide the education locally. It allows people to, uh, to share discoveries at great distances. We wouldn't have some of the current scientific uh, developments that we have if it weren't for the internet and the ability of people to share their discoveries across very long distances. It can bring specialist medical care from concentration of a population to rural places. Everybody doesn't have to travel so much in order to do that. It can speed information flow around dense urban areas so that vehicular traffic can go down, pollution goes down. But of course, the other thing about the internet is it can bring us together when we're separated by vast distances. When I was growing up, the kind of video conferencing that we can use today was a total science fiction dream. And now we do it all the time. That's in fact how the internet work, or the internet society works most of the time. I don't see my colleagues face to face most days. Most days I see them on a video screen, um, but we, uh, we collaborate effectively. So great, it brings all these benefits. But like humans, the internet can bring some of the worst in humans as well. As long as there have been humans, there have been thieves, there have been liars, there have been people committing fraud. For as long as there have been governments, there have been people trying to steal power. These are big social problems. They're part of humanity. But for the plots and schemes of villains, the internet is just another tool, something that they'll use in order to achieve their ends. What's worse, the internet doesn't give us the kinds of clues that, you know, real life does. If you go into a risky or an unfamiliar neighborhood, you keep your wits about you. You feel it, you're more alert. When you're dealing in an unfamiliar shop or dealing with a stranger in a commercial transaction or you're dealing with somebody who doesn't quite speak your language, you take care not to be taken advantage of. Keep your hand on your wallet. The internet doesn't give us these clues. On the internet, it's easy to pretend to be someone else. You can take advantage of inadequate security practices that were designed for a world where the danger is really there in the immediate vicinity of you. On the internet, basically everyone is nearby and they can take advantage of those things. And they do take advantage of those things, we see it. And so for a lot of people, for many of us, the internet feels like a threat. And to counter this, some people argue for a different vision of the network, a network that is centrally managed and has a lot of controls built into the network itself. Now, they still call this the internet, but it isn't the real network of networks. This is the pretender net. The idea is that the controls need to be placed in some central authority, whether it be governments or the network authority, the network operators, somebody, it doesn't really matter. It's a central place. And the idea is that peace, order, and the rule of law is maintained because of that central control. It's understandable. I'm not pretending that there are no problems on the internet, and none of us wants a technology that is too dangerous for humans to use but I want you to think a little bit about what these proposals look like 
And I'm hoping that the rest of this conference and then the follow-on uh, work will lead us to better solutions. Because the, the, the proposals that are on the table sometimes, I think are quite bad. For instance, to solve the urgent social problems of terrorism and child abuse online, there is a technical fix proposal floating around that has gained a lot of traction with certain governments, and it requires every network to use filters developed and deployed by a few very large social media companies. Now these proposals might work, although I think they probably will not, but they will certainly cement the technical and power advantages of the large companies that we're talking about. It will make it very hard to evolve the internet in various places, and it will also make it very hard for new players to enter the market. Many countries, including many developing, developing countries, embrace network development as large turnkey projects. You see these all the time. You build everything at once, you get one large vendor or maybe a handful of them, and they promise to manage everything for you for the rest of time. Now, the idea is usually that these proposals will get the network developed and delivered faster than a more piecemeal approach, building a little bit at a time. The promises are very often not confirmed by experience. You get these very large projects. They don't really deliver things faster anyway. The other thing about it is that these very large turnkey projects are often very, very expensive. Also, very often, these very large projects don't do very much for domestic skills uh, development. What you end up with, really, is an expensive network that you can't operate yourself. It should not be too surprising to anyone that projects like that sound uncomfortably like colonial infrastructure projects of the past. To solve problems of safety and security, Various policymakers have proposed widespread internet surveillance and weak encryption that is supposed to be breakable only by the authorities and immune to other attacks. Vendors see this opportunity and they will sell you all day long everything that you ever could possibly want in order to implement this technology. The problem is none of that stuff works. They don't work because this is a desire that cannot be satisfied. What really happens is these systems undermine the safety and security of everyone. They even undermine the security of the authorities' own communications networks. To solve the issues of fake news and election interference, various people have suggested reinventing the internet routing infrastructure. Usually this is to make it depend entirely on national borders rather than allowing uh, connectivity to work across borders. Or else people propose impossibly hard identity requirements on everything that gets posted online. And sometimes both of these proposals come at once. Now there's very little reason to believe that these proposals will actually solve the problems of fake news or election interference because people have been committing fake news and election interference long before the internet was a gleam in anyone's eye. What they will do is make sure that the systems that we, ha we get will be more expensive and less reliable than the internet. And that would be a tragedy. What we humans need to do is to use the internet, this great tool for our collective betterment. We need to use it for the good of all. That means we need to use the internet way of networking to make the internet safe for us all without losing the advantages of the open, voluntary, general purpose network that lets new ideas and new opportunities flourish. Local communities should be able to work on problems that affect them most pressingly while reaching out to draw on the resources of the whole world. This is the network that Ethiopians should have if you want it. One that is open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy. But this is also the network that Ethiopia can make. You have the natural advantages that I mentioned before. And the internet way of networking enlists us all in making the internet better. Ethiopia may want the internet to grow here, the Internet Society is here very proudly and with our new and energetic chapter, shout out to the chapter again. We want to help, but we want your help too. Because the Internet 
needs Ethiopia. We need your creativity. We need the observations that you can make, that you can offer in order to make the internet of the future. That's because the internet is for everyone. Thank you very much.